The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Yeah, we've had a great time. Uh, went to the Billy Graham Library, went up to the Epicenter, done a whole lot of other cool things, uh, went to a plantation, so uh, we're having a great time. Uh, I have heard great things about this conference, and I was excited to be invited this year and, and able to attend, so uh, thank you. It's, it's great to have you all here. Um, this talk is called Practical Computerized Home Automation. Uh, yes, I am a Postgres core team member. That's what most people know me as, but also being a computer guy, I'm a tinker, and uh, sort of over the years have developed a, uh, a little sort of uh, hobby of sort of automating some stuff in the house. Uh, I'm going to kind of give you some, some little tricks in, in terms of how I did it. Um, the trick not as all, the, you know, it's kind of funny, the trick with home automation is not always technical. Uh, it's often, uh, the trick is often uh, convincing your family that you're doing a good thing, <laughs> okay? Um, that you're not crazy, uh, that the, uh, you know, sort of boxes that keep coming every couple weeks are not sort of this, uh, sort of, uh, you know, your, your family's grinning and bearing it, and also, um, not spooking your family out, which is a big uh, sort of trick for home automation because uh, it's one of the few cases where your work is directly interfacing with your family. Because again, I don't think my family really understands what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not sure how many of you, it's sort of like, I don't know, he stares at the screen and does things and then checks come, right? Uh, is about, you know, is about the level. Um, and, and they watch me and they hear me at talks and, you know, they pick up funny terms that I use and stuff. But in general, it's not something that they're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, however, with home automation, they kind of are, whether they like it or not. Um, so there are a couple spooky things about home automation I'll talk about. And I think uh, overall you're going to find there's a lot of really good things about it. Uh, so, uh, again, usually I give this talk with my, my son, whose name actually appears on the slide. In this case, my wife will be sort of pinch hitting for him uh, to give her feedback on little things that she sees. Um, the goal of this talk for me is to basically inspire you into, uh, into doing some home automation on your own. Um, and, and, and frankly, uh, trying to give you not so much the operational or technical um, understanding of home automation, but more of the procedural and the process and identifying when home automation makes sense for your home and when home automation does not make sense for your home. Um, and I think that I've sort of gleaned over years of experimenting with my own family um, and also being kind of cautious about how I went at it. Uh, so I'll give you some tricks to the trade. Uh, and so before we start, are there any questions? Uh, we do have an hour, which I'm excited about. Uh, I do have a second presentation, which I might pull slides from, depending on whether we have time. Uh, this presentation, along with uh, 30 other presentations, not all on home automation, thankfully, uh, are at that website. Uh, that is my home page. It has you know, my blog and uh, a lot of Postgres presentations, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, and again, this is Creative Commons license if anybody wants to use it. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, um, he, he, he played with home automation in the past, started using compact fluorescence, and was getting uh, uh, problems with some of the uh, settings. I will cover that in this session. Uh, and in fact, I have some diagrams that kind of explain it a little bit. Uh, and there are some, uh, some adjustments you can make which will vastly improve the problem. Okay, other questions? Okay, let's get started. Okay, um, so what, what, what basically is available uh, for home automation? Um, and basically I'm gonna start by kind of talking about uh, some of the pre, what I would consider um, non-programmic automation. So 
Many of you may have automation already in your homes and not really realize it. Um, again, the, the topic of this conversation is practical computerized home automation. Okay, so let's start with home automation that isn't computerized or at least doesn't relate to uh, a typical server. Uh, so first one, timers. How many people have timers in their homes? Right? Okay. Uh, do you have to reset those every time you lose power? Yeah, every time the time zone change, I mean, daylight savings time, you have to change it. Um, but yeah, they work really well. I don't think anybody has a clapper. I'd be surprised. Um, you know, clap on, clap off. Uh, but it is automation, right? It's kind of cool, you know, excite your friends. Um, obviously, that's a sound control uh, system. Uh, dust on sensors, I bet half the room has some of that in some, yeah, in some sense. But usually it's, it's, it's uh, integrated with something, right? So it's a sensor integrated with a, a light or uh, some type of light socket which has a sensor to it or you've added a sensor to a light and you bring an electrician in and he kind of sets it up. I know we had one at our old house and um, it broke once and then he had to come and redo it. Uh, but uh, it actually worked out well, right? You'd come out, it would see you moving. Sometimes you do this to it to get it to go. Um, but, but again, that's sort of a non-programmatic automation case. Uh, and of course, motion sensor is the same kind of thing. Uh, you know, move your hand or walk by and, and it goes on. Um, one of the, pr some of the problems you see with some of these is you start to see the limitations of the technology. Uh, you know, motion sensor, it never, oh, it doesn't always work right. Um, it just, it just always seemed to be kind of something that never went on exactly when you thought it would and then it would go on after you walked by or, you know, something crazy like that. Um, but again, these are, these are non-programmatic. So let's take a look at programmatic automation. This is really, I think, where the excitement comes. Uh, this is where your, 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 your skills start to work and where you really start to get what I want to say a multiplicative effect with automation. And again, I think that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about sort of through the, through the session. Um, in in non-programmatic automation, each device is an island. So you have a motion sensor. It's wired to a bulb, OK? You have a timer. It's wired to a lamp or something like that, OK? You even have a dawn and dusk sensor, but again, it's wired to a specific thing. What happens with programmatic automation is that all of a sudden, you, you open a whole new, you now can have your devices communicating with each other. And as soon as that happens, your, your automation, you take on a lot more possibilities than you normally would in a case where each one's an island. I almost think of it as the internet, right? You know, if you have a computer and it's just a computer sitting there, uh, you know, if it doesn't have internet, there's not a whole lot you can do with it, right? Yeah, you can go into word processor and do some stuff. But, but again, a lot of devices are really hampered because they don't have the internet. When you have the internet, all of a sudden you can go get videos, you can send email. There's a whole bunch of, there's a multiplicative effect when you're on the internet that you can do that you don't have when you're in a, a standalone device. And I think that's really, to me, the, the sort of, um, this is where hope automation takes off. And, and, and the downside, frankly, is I have not seen as many people kind of take this leap. Uh, they've got timers, they've got, uh, dawn dust sensors, but, but they don't really always have um, the kind of multiplicative effect that you get with a computer controlled automation system where all these devices are now working together and now you're sitting at a terminal or a cron job or some type of script that's running every time something happens and all of a sudden you can make all these crazy things happen that didn't necessarily happen before. All right, so let me, let me be, uh, and I know that's really way up in the sky, but I'm going to be really specific as I go forward. So let's take a look at what things we have here. So program autom automation specifically, you can combine the behavior devices. So for example, when, um, when we decide we're going to eat dinner or lunch, a whole bunch of things can happen in the house with one action, okay? Or if somebody calls on the phone, and it's a specific individual based on caller ID. I can do all these other things that, again, I couldn't necessarily do if all these were an island. Okay. The second thing is that you don't have distance limitations. So again, instead of having a case where you've got your, your motion sensor over here, but there's nothing 
you can't do anything around, outside that motion sensor or, or whatever's specifically wired between that motion sensor and something else. It's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a fungible issue, right? It's, it's basically a hardwired in most cases. With, home, with computerized home automation, now there's no distance requirements. So somebody can do something over here, you can do something over there. You don't have the kind of sort of rigid limitations that you normally would have in a hardwired automation, non-programmatic adequate automation. You can detect activity. Um, your programs can now be scriptable. So you can do all sorts of things like, I want this to happen, but only during the day. I don't want it to happen at night or while I'm sleeping. Again, very hard to do in a, in a hardwired system, very easy to do when a computer starts to get involved. And you can also access external data. So you can go out and get the temperature. You can go out and get the cloud cover. You can go out and get uh, whether it's a vacation day or not for the United States. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do. You can send SMS messages. You can, you can receive emails in and trigger things. Uh, you can have people go to web pages and do stuff. I mean, a whole bunch of crazy stuff can now be done that necessarily couldn't be done before. So uh, how is this possible? Well, uh, basically, let's take a look at the networks you have in your house, all right? Uh, you have a telephone network. I know it doesn't sound like a network, but it is, right? You pick up the phone, you dial something, you call somebody else. It's a network, all right? Uh, you have a cordless phone. That's probably, in some sense, a wireless network in a, in a very crude sense. Um, you can call from one phone to another. It's sort of something there. Uh, you might have wired Ethernet, at least at some portion of your home. Uh, you probably have a wireless Ethernet at the same time. Um, and then you also have something that you don't really think of as a network, and that is your electrical system. Uh, why is your electrical system important? Well, uh, your electrical system is important because, like, if you're going to turn something on and off, odds are it's using electricity. So, although I'm not really ready to run, you know, uh, Ethernet to everywhere, or I'm really not ready to put a wireless hotspot on every device I want to control, I probably have some electrical cord or electrical wiring that runs between the computer and all these other things, okay? I know it doesn't sound like something you would use often, but in fact, it works out really, really well, and I'm gonna explain uh, why exactly right now. So, this is the way that the electrical system normally works in your home. Um, basically, it has a cycle of 60 hertz, at least in the United States. I think in Europe, it's 50. Um, and it's basically just going up and down, up and down, and that's alternating current, right? It's kind of going, and I'm sure there's people here who understand this much better than I do, so I'm not gonna pretend. But effectively, your, your electrical system is doing this all the time. It's doing this in this room, wherever you are, okay? Um, obviously, during this electrical system, there are periods where the uh, electrical goes to the, the origin, which is sort of the center line, right? This center red line here. Um, and it's going to be crossing back and forth. And about 30 or 40 years ago, uh, I believe in the 70s, somebody realized that they could send messages along this electrical wiring system without interfering with the actual transmission of power. So if you've ever heard of power over Ethernet, this is a similar kind of thing, although much cruder than that. So basically what they ended up doing um, was to send signals across this, they basically create a little blip every time this cycles over that origin point, okay? Um, so if you add up a bunch of these, and again, you're, you've got 60 cycles a second, so you've got, I think, technically 120 crossings, okay, in a second. So you've got 120 bits to work with. Tremendously slow, but that's okay in, in a lot of cases. Okay, you can actually encode commands into this stream of data that's getting broadcast through your, all your entire house that you don't have to wire, that you don't have to really do a whole lot of work with. Okay, so effectively what's happening is that every time it kind of goes over, it's encoding some bits, a one or a zero. There's kind of a, a header that you have that indicates here comes a, a command that's coming across my network. Um, and effectively, that allow, you can put devices in different locations that can listen for these little blips. So you have a transmitter, which is sending the blips, and then you have, it's going across the whole house, and then all these devices can actually read these blips as they come across, and then, then perform actions based on, 
on the blips that it sees come across. Okay. So what does this actually look like in real life? Well, here's an oscilloscope. Again, I didn't write this. This is a, an image from somebody. Actually, it's from, uh, it's from this website right here at the bottom. Um, but effectively, that's the, the standard you know, sine wave coming across. And uh, what does it look like when you're actually sending these signals? Well, it actually looks like these sort of trapezoids, I guess we will call them, um, which are effectively making signals as the, as the data comes across. OK. So um, I'm sorry, yes, ma'am. You mean like a circuit breaker? Yes. OK, so the question is, is there any impact of different circuit breakers um, in your system? Are they different networks? I am actually going to cover that. Um, that. That is actually a concern. And there are some ways, as I said to this gentleman, that you have to kind of protect against that. OK. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying this is the be all and end all way to do it. OK? I'm just kind of giving the groundwork of the way somebody did it, and you can think of other ways to do it. Because of course, this is just one method. You could do it wirelessly. You could do it via 80211. I mean, whatever, you know, whatever method you want to use to communicate to these devices, there are actually a bunch of them. And I'm going to cover them just really briefly at the end here. But I'm just giving you one example. So effectively, OK, 1975, you've got this idea. Again, 120 cycles across, 120 bits per second. Um, and then you can basically assign numbers or, uh, you know, assign device codes to these things. Um, and you basically set up this kind of protocol, which happens to be called X10. But again, there are a lot of other ones. Uh, some of the other popular ones are Z-Wave, uh, Universal Power Bus. Anybody heard of that? Uh, Insteon is sort of a hybrid between uh, X10 and wireless. Um, any others? Somebody, anybody's familiar with? Those are probably the big ones. Yeah, there's commercial protocols that, yeah, the data bus. Those are, yeah, those are really high end stuff. Yeah, um, but again, it's it's kind of interesting. Again, it's um, one of the tricks with this is, um, well, this is kind of going off topic, but it, but it kind of relates. Um, one of the tricks with this is if you come, if you basically start. And you say, OK, I got to put out $1,500 to get started with home automation in my home. OK? That's, and I've got to do a lot of wiring to make it happen, right? There's a lot of people who are just going to be like, I, I can't do that. Like, I can't, I don't really know what the benefit's going to be to my family. So therefore, I'm not really sure that I want to put out that money and then decide that I don't want it, right? So a lot of the trick with, because very few people have home automation at this level, and they haven't actually seen the benefits, it's really hard to sort of get that initial expense. Um, and that's why a lot of times you're looking at doing something over the power line or something very inexpensively to get started. Because although you may end up spending $1,500 by the time the whole thing's done, OK, <laughs> you don't really want to put it out not knowing, you know, sort of you know, being a pioneer and not really understanding what you're going to get out of this. Um, and that's why I think the X10 makes it real easy, or Insteon makes it real easy to kind of get started with a couple inexpensive devices, and then you basically grow it over time. Um, and, and again, because you're not physically changing the wiring in your house, you can always undo it. You're not bringing in an electrician every time to have it done, which really, you know, the price just goes berserk at that point, right? Um, so again, this is just kind of a kind of an, an example. In fact, um, the, the way I got involved with it was uh, kind of an odd case. I had somebody, I had an electrician working in my house, and uh, my wife wanted a switch on one floor to control a light on another floor. So you know, like she wanted a wall switch in one place to control a light somewhere else. And we looked at the, you know, I looked at sort of the wall configuration, and I'm like, this is going to be really hard. So I asked the electrician, you know, can you do this? And he's like, this is going to be really hard. So I'm like, okay, great. Uh, this is not going to work too well. And he's like, have you, have you looked at some type of like, you know, sort of X10 or or whatever system that would allow the communication between a switch wirelessly and a switch downstairs, and would actually allow you to can turn it on and off? And I'm like. You know, I really hadn't, I, I heard of this X10 thing, but I never, I never really got involved with it. I didn't really know it worked. He said, yeah, it does. He said, I've often, when I'm wiring a house, will offer the, the customer, do you want 
some sort of home automation, like a control panel or something that you can basically program to do all this stuff. And he said, you know, he, they're like, well, I don't know. And he said, all right, let me spec it out. I'll give you two quotes, right? And the quote to do the automation is usually about $700 more than the non-automation, which is completely reasonable. Um, but he says nobody ever takes the automation. I, you know, there's something to saying there, because what it's basically saying is that, that it's very hard to sell somebody they don't, it's very hard to sell something to somebody who has never seen it or do, they don't know that the benefits that they can get. Um, you know, if sort of you, if you try, I remember when I was on the internet and nobody else was, I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I'm on the internet and we're sending email and they're like, you do what? Like, yeah, you send an email and it goes out onto the Usenet and then you get replies back and like nobody really knew what that was and only really when it became sort of ubiquitous, I was like, okay, now I understand I want to be on the internet. But again, in the early years, if I said, hey, I can get you on the internet too, they'd be like, no, no, it's okay, I'm, I'm too busy, that's not really, yeah. I, mean, I know, it sounds really crazy now, but at the time, you remember, right, it was like, we were on the internet, we had our own domain name, and we were getting email by UCP and all these things, and, and, and everyone was kind of like, okay, it's really interesting, you know. Um, yeah, so, uh, so again, a lot of it is, is really kind of getting that first um, sort of impetus from people and, and getting the thing going. Um, so this is actually the X10 protocol. Again, this is not the be-all and end-all, but one, just one way of doing home automation. Um, basically, you have a house code on the left, uh, which is made up of bit patterns, and then you have devices on the right, 1 to 16, as you can see right right there, it stops at 16, and then you have a whole bunch of other things that allow you to dim lights and do all sorts of other crazy things. Um, so um, what are the limitations? Well, this kind of gets to the sort of the problem. Well, the first problem is, again, we only have 120 bits per second, so we're not going to be able to flash the lights on 20 times a second, right? That's not going to happen. Um, uh, in fact, the, the, the bandwidth is, is fairly limited. Um, you're probably going to see about seven, three quarters of a second delay to turn something on. Uh, and, and again, that's part of the fact that they will send the command twice to verify that it actually is the right command because again, line noise and things like compact fluorescence can cause all sorts of unusual noise in the system. So a device has to normally see the thing, something twice before it will, it will actually act on it. Um, poor propagation in split phase electricity distributions and unfortunately most houses are split phase. This gets back to the thing with the, with the panel, different um, circuit breakers, and I'm going to go into that in detail. Uh, line noise, like things like uh, complex fluorescence can affect you, and even other buildings sending X10 can affect you. Fortunately, I'm in a, you know, I'm fairly uh, sparse neighborhood, so I've never seen that problem, but I can see it being very, very uh, a big problem. So this is actually a, the split phase issue, and again, I'm sure there are people who understand this better than I, I do, um, but effectively you have 220 coming into your house, that 220 is split into 110 uh, at the breaker downstairs in the basement in my case. Um, and you basically half your house is on one 110 and half your house is on another 110. Um, that's normally just the way that, that, that it's wired. Um, so effectively, if you have one segment on the 110 and you need to get it send a signal to another device that's on the other one, well effectively the signal has to go all the way back out to not only the house, but sometimes out to the street, out to the transformer, okay? That's wherever that is in your neighborhood. And then it's gotta come back out again to get onto that other phase, all right? And this is why sometimes you see propagation problems within, uh, within the particular design. Uh, one cool thing, way to fix this, and unfortunately this, this uh, part is no longer uh, in production, but there is a, a secondary part that is available. Uh, is something that will actually combine the two phases within your home. And you're thinking, well, that sounds really risky, right? Like, why would I want to do that? And, you know, wouldn't I kill myself and don't I have to get an electrician? Well, if you have anything that runs on 220 within your home, uh, there are devices that you can buy which will combine the two phases within your home. Basically, when, think about it, when, you're, when you've got this thing plugged in and it's running, it's running on both phases, isn't it? It's because it's running on 220. So there's just sort of certain devices in your home that have 220 natively. Um, the classic case would be 
X10 runs great when I'm running my dryer, but when my dryer is not running, it won't work, right? Um, I don't think people want to keep their dryer running, but they have developed some very sophisticated um, devices which will plug. Basically, what happens is the device plugs into your 220, and then you plug your dryer or your air conditioner into the, the back of the device. So it's basically like piggyback between your 220 device and the electrical power. And then again, it, it, actually, um, it, it actually bridges them together. Again, this device would not be the one we would use. We would use basically a, what, what, uh, basically a, a split phase joiner is what they call it, um, which allows those signals to come, to come through much better. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is another diagram kind of talking about the issue with split phase. And, and, and one of the problems that you have um, is that the two phases are often um, opposite from each other, as you can see from the diagram on the right, bottom right there. Um, and again, this kind of fixes that as well to make sure that they're, they're kind of synchronized. Um, these devices, you know, they're not cheap. They're like, I think I bought one, it was $60, I think. So it wasn't, you know. But again, I was already down the road at this point. So you got to, it's almost like you got to bootstrap the thing. It's like getting on the internet. Well, the internet does, nobody cares about the internet until you can do something cool. And then we can do something cool, everyone wants to be on it. Well, you've got to get to that point, And then once you kind of cover that hurdle, the $60 doesn't, doesn't feel too bad. Uh, line noise, somebody uh, mentioned the problem with complex fluorescence. The big problem I've seen is not so much complex fluorescence, but um, UPS devices, so universal uh, uninter uninterrupted power supplies that actually sit between the electrical system and my computer. Do you know what those uh, un uninterruptible power supplies are also supposed to do? They're supposed to clean the power. And you know what X10 looks like? Noise, right? So obviously, you've got this device in your house that basically hates X10. Um, and, and, and wants to basically suppress all that line noise that you're trying to get to propagate through your whole house. So the only, I have not seen complex fluorescent problems as much as I've seen UPS problems. So I actually had to buy a device that sits between my UPS and the electrical plug, which will isolate that, that's the, actually basically isolate the server and the UPS from the rest of the network. Uh, and that actually, uh, that actually worked really well. One of the real downsides, frankly, with electrical power distribution, electric power signals, is that you have to do a lot of this diagnosis. Um, that unless you're bringing in an expert who's done this before and can say, OK, that's going to be a problem, that's going to be a problem, that's going to be a problem, I know how to fix all those, you end up sort of being the guinea pig and having to sort of experiment and figure out, well, if I unplug the UPS, then, oh, my X10 works. But if I plug it in, it doesn't work, right? If my dryer's running, X10 works. If my dryer's not running, X10 doesn't work, right? So you have to kind of do some research to kind of learn how this works. And it's very frustrating. And the other problem is that as you add devices to your system, as you, do, as you plug devices into your house, you have the potential, each device has the potential to somehow adversely affect this. So there are some new technologies that have come around. Uh, Universal Power Bus, Z-Wave I mentioned, uh, Insteon, which eventually basically say, OK, this electrical system idea works, but we really need a different way of doing it. Um, I believe the Universal Power Bus actually sends a different uh, frequency signal across your network. Uh, it has, a, it has a, a distance limit of a mile. OK? So all of a sudden, you have a much more capable system which basically can do a lot more without the type of downsides of trying to send the, pa the data across this network. Uh, the downside is that the devices are fairly expensive. So again, it's a little harder to get involved with. But again, when you're doing home automation, you say, OK, how much am I willing to spend up front? Where do I think I'm going? And then you know, sort of what technology really fits best for me. So that's enough about. X10 or the actual electrical technology, let's actually see what it does, right? Um, in this case, we have um, a diagram of my house. Uh, this is the first floor. Uh, as you can see on the left, we have the garage. Uh, on the right, the family room, and then so forth. Now, um, each of the circles, the yellow circles, basically represents a light bulb or multiple light bulbs. Um, so effectively, if you look at the front of the house, which happens to be at the bottom here, you can see a whole bunch of lighting at the front of the house that actually is controlled by X10. 
okay? Many of these required an electrician to put in because I had to actually replace switches. And I didn't really need an electrician to put the switches in, except that they were three-way switches, which means that when you put in a three-way switch, you have to make sure that the X10 device has to be on the, the load side of the circuit. And I didn't really know how to do that, so I brought an electrician and he was able to do it for me. But again, um, when you would normally the way the three, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can wire a three-way switch, but usually one of them's on the load side and one of them's on the, the, the ground side. If you put the switch, if you put the X10 detector on the ground side, effectively the electricity is going through the switch, through the bulb, and then coming to the ground before you see that signal. And obviously they, there's all sorts of distortions that can happen when they go around. So um, the front of the house actually has some lights there. Uh, to turn those lights on, I used to have a dawn and dusk sensor that wasn't reliable enough. I ended up going out and writing a little script that goes out to the internet, finds out when sundown is, um, goes to the weather service, finds out what the, what the cloud cover is, and then I could basically predict when I want these lights to go on. Um, and I didn't necessarily want the lights to go on all the way, so I actually dimmed them because I find that most houses, if you've ever seen, you ever see a house that has like one really bright, bright bulb and you're like, you know, this really is not working here because the house just doesn't look right because it's just this one huge porch bulb on this huge house. Um, and it's usually too bright. So basically one of the nice things with X10 is that you can control how much electricity is getting to that bulb. So you can basically go outside as I did with my laptop and I basically, at night, and I'm basically like, okay, I want this to be a little brighter over here, I want this to be a little darker, and you can actually sort of, sort of tableau your house, okay, to kind of give it a certain light effect, um, which obviously you can't do unless you want to go out and buy a bazillion bulbs, uh, wattages they don't make, okay, and try screwing them in until they actually look the way you want them to, which I don't think you're going to do. Uh, so again, this is sort of the a case where you're using your home automation to do stuff that you couldn't really do on your own. If that's not crazy enough, you're like, you know, I kind of like the way it looks, but I'm not sure if that's really the optimal thing to do. So let's, let's add a little randomness in here. So every day, the lights are a little different, right? They're a little brighter in some places. They're a little darker in others. Uh, yes, it's, it's not really a light show. They don't actually change during the night, although they could, right? Um, but it does give it a little bit of a variability. Uh, you know, you'll drive in the house, you're like, oh, wow, the porch is really bright today, or oh, the, you know, the front door's a little brighter, or whatever. Um, sometimes it gets kind of dim in certain parts, but again, you, know, you just add a little variability there, uh, and it adds a little excitement. Uh, any questions? Before, I'm, I'm gonna stay on this slide, though. So, um, those are the light bulbs in the front. Um, as you can see, the server is right here, and we're gonna be talking about that in a couple minutes. Um, the, uh, we also have something called chimes. They're the actual uh, red things here, the red, uh, red boxes. You see those? Um, and they're in different parts of the house. So we had a case where we need, certain times we need to tell everybody it's time to eat or come down and do something or somebody's on the phone that's important, like me, right? Um, so uh, it turns out that when I call the house, it, it looks at the caller ID and then it it makes a noise so they know that who's on the phone, basically. Um, but the problem, particularly with the, with the kitchen bell, which is how this all started, was that I used to have a speaker in the computer room. And when my wife would say, OK, it's time to eat, it would make this big chime sound. Well, I don't know how many of you have been like in clock towers or bell towers, but you know when that thing rings, it's really loud. Uh, and that's really not a great system because if anyone was in the computer room at the time, they got like the shock of their life, okay? Um, and if I tried taking the volume down, then basically they couldn't hear it in the rest of the house, right? So you've got this sort of problem where you want to distribute the sound kind of evenly throughout the house and you don't want to basically blow out the ears of the guy who happens to be in the office, right? So the solution there were, was that they do make certain uh, uh, chime devices that you can, again, just plug into the wall. It just, I think I have a picture of one right somewhere. Nope, I don't have a picture. Sorry about that. Let me, let me straighten up here. So um, you, have, you basically have these chime devices. You can put them different places in the house, and they make a, a little ding-dong sound, OK? And again, you can place them at strategic points in the house. When you decide you want to ring the bell, it makes sort of a pleasant sound 
at a reasonable volume uh, universally throughout the house, which again is something that would be hard to do with a single speaker. Um, what else do we have here? Well, let's see, we have the green, uh, which are actually a wireless remote. So uh, you basically have like a wire, like you know, have a remote for a TV. Well, now you have a remote for your lights. So if you want to turn off lights, if you're going to watch a movie, you don't have to go around and turn off every light. You can basically just go to the remote and say, turn off the lights, and then they go off in that room. Um, and it's, it's kind of convenient. Again, you wouldn't think of a remote for a light bulb, but it actually works really well. Um, particularly when like, the room is dark and you're watching something and then somebody wants to get up, well, how do you find the light to turn it on because the room is dark because you're watching something, right? I mean, you know, this chicken and egg thing. So if you have a little remote control, you can turn on the lights. Um, uh, so that, that actually works really well. Um, let's see, we have, so we talked about that. We got the wireless remotes, which allow you to turn on and off lights. We got the coffee maker, which is always a big win. Um, obviously, you can turn on and off electrical devices really easy. If you can turn on bulbs, you can turn off electrical devices. Anything you can plug in, coffee maker you plug in, bingo, it works. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, part of the demonstration we have, my wife has a little button on her phone which says coffee. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was, can you, do, uh, can you do it with your smartphone? And yes, you can. Um, it, it, there's basically a, a program to button, and she just hits it, and then it turns it on. So um, she can, assuming somebody sets up the coffee maker, right, then uh, effectively uh, she can go out somewhere, and then when she's on her way home, she can hit the button and know the coffee will be ready by the time she gets home. Um, which makes, means that I don't have to turn on the coffee maker because I usually don't do it very well. Um, and, and she can basically kind of control it, and my aunt is happy to set it up, so actually it's a, it's a great system. Um, and also, there's a, you can also turn it on with a remote, so there's a, one, there's a remote in the bathroom so that she takes her shower, she hits the button, by the time she comes down, the coffee's ready, right? Um, again, not, I, don't think, I don't think half of these things you're going to use but again, you start to think of, OK, what can I automate that works for my, for my family, right? There's going to be things you're going to think about that have nothing to do with what I'm doing. Um, but when you start to see, OK, what repetitive things is my family doing? What ways can I make that more efficient? Um, what ways can I, can I do stuff that they, didn't really want to, that they didn't really know they wanted to do? Then you start to see some of the potential that you can do uh, with, with the home automation. Um, Let's go to the next slide. This is actually the, the second floor. Oh, the pool pump is not on the second floor, but you get the idea. Um, uh, so uh, again, you, have, uh, you can see a number of these wireless remotes, the green boxes that are in different parts of the house. You see a couple of the red chimes. You see a couple of the bulbs. Okay, Some of these lights go on with, time, with, with cron jobs from the server. Uh, so again, that's all kind of controlled centrally from one location. Uh, the wireless remote actually here is really cool. Um, it's a very small remote, and you just hit a button, and then all the lights in the house go off. So instead of sort of having to shut off all the lights to go upstairs or shut the lights off to get in the bed, you can basically just get in bed, hit a button, boom, the whole house goes off. Um, so it, it does make it easier for you to basically not have to go around and do a lot of manual turning on, turning off. Um, that, 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 that doesn't, it doesn't work too well. I mean, the classic case is like you go in the bedroom, you flip the light on, switch that's on the wall, you get ready for bed, but then if you get up to turn the switch off, then you can't find the bed because it's so dark in the room now, right? Um, so then you go and you turn on the, the light next to the, um, next to the bed, and then you go to turn off the light, and then you go, right? so anyway, you see what's kind of going on. Um, so that's how you, the pool pump's kind of cool. Um, that basically, um, uh, again, if you've ever had to do a pool, it's got a timer on it usually. It's got to run a certain number of times, in, you know, an hour or a day, a certain number of hours a day. One of the cool things is that the warmer it is, the more it has to run. So you can actually go out, find out the temperature, and then run your pool pump more or less depending on how hot it is, right? So you save electricity. Um, it actually keeps your pool cleaner because it knows kind of this is a big, you know, like September, it isn't going to run as much as it is in July. And, and again, I'm not about to go out there and like fiddle with the little timer every time. I'm just not going to do it, right? 
Um, so this kind of takes that away from me. I travel a lot too, so if I don't have to deal with it, it's, it's kind of better. Um, you know, because I'm not going to be there all the time to, to fiddle with this stuff. Uh, so what does what some of these things look like? This is actually a switch on a wall. The, the one on the right is a traditional switch. The one on the left is a push button X10. Why is it a push button? Well, because it can be turned on and off remotely as well, so we can't really use an up and down switch in the same way, although there are some cases where you could, but again, they just went with a button. Uh, this is a rocker switch, again, just for different decor. Press the button, it goes on or off, and again, has a similar computer control. Uh, this is a three-way switch, um, and you can see there's a bunch of them. Some of them are uh, uh, actual, well, on a three-way switch, you have one detector switch and one non-detector switch. You can see it look a little different. Uh, this is actually a wireless switch, which well, you wouldn't think was possible, and actually relates to what I talked about originally, where somebody wanted to switch somewhere. So this is just a plate that sits on the wall. So you basically just take the plate, you take the stick them off the back, and you just go, OK, stick it on the wall, right? How does that work? Well, there's a little like watch battery in there that lasts for like a couple of years. And when you press the button, it sends a wireless signal, not X10, but a wireless signal. And there's a detector, which has a little antenna on it, right? And the antenna picks up the signal from this thing, and it sends an X10 signal across your network for, you know, Whatever you've programmed, you can program these buttons to be certain device numbers. And when you say on for that device number, this thing picks up the signal, sends the signal across the wireless network, and then, turn, and then wherever, that, wherever that device is plugged in somewhere else, it's going to turn it on. Okay. So the cool thing is not only is there control along the power system, but we now have remote controls. We now have sort of wireless switches, which don't have to, don't need an electrician, can be put anywhere. You don't have to put a hole in the wall. You can move it around, whatever you want. Uh, and the battery lasts a surprising long time. It's kind of interesting how well that works. Um, this is actually the remote next to the bed. The, uh, the F, the four button is the one that shuts off everything. So if you press that, this button right here, um, you just get the, there's this like sort of sound, which is like everything just you know, it shuts down. Yes? Is that um, actually do something when it's like on the power? Like, even if, you know, the kid wants to use the bed, do they just go and turn on the electric or something? Okay, so does that do anything with the power? No, it does nothing with the power. Um, effectively, it's merely sending a signal to the light to go off. Somebody can just put a button and turn it on again. Um, in fact, I, I think, you know, subconsciously, we have four kids, like when it gets to be midnight and we're going to bed and some kids are still up, we're like, you know, I'm going to hit that button, right? You know, uh, you know, if they want to stay up, they're going to get up and they're going to turn the light on. And hopefully it's going to push them up. Um, in fact, I've gotten a little tricky because I don't know if you're this way, but if you're in your house and all your lights are on, like I can stay up to like one or two o'clock because it's like pfft, all lights are on, right? I mean, you just, there's this sense that, that, well, it's not nighttime because there's all these lights here. And, and subconsciously, you just think, well, I'm just going to keep working because I got a lot of light here and I don't feel tired. So one of the tricks I started to do was to actually program the lights to kind of start to shut off. So certain lights will turn on at dusk. But as it gets later at night, more lights will start to shut off. Um, and in fact, I programmed it so when it gets to midnight, all the lights go off, even if you're downstairs. Because, like, if that didn't get you up, then, all right, you can get up and turn the light on yourself. But hopefully that's going to kind of push you to get up because, you know, the, the sun's still going to come up at the, right, the same time, whether you stay up or not. So um, there's a certain psychological uh, thing that you can program in there to basically um, defeat what the light is doing to your sleep patterns, and that is extending it, you know. I mean, before they had electricity, pfft, People went to bed like 8.30, right? Because that's you couldn't do much at night, and then you got up real early because that's when the sun got up. Um, what happens is with the electrical light bulb, you now your day is now extended. People don't get as much sleep, and, and you, it, it kind of plays with your, your psychology a little bit. So I'm going to fight that, and I'm going to play the other direction. So. Um, yeah, so they can, they can shut it on. And in fact, if she hits this button, or I hit that button, all the lights in the house go on everywhere. So, uh, you know, if for some reason you just wanted all lights on or you heard a noise and you know what it was, turn all the lights on. You're not going to be crawling downstairs in the dark because everything's going to be on. Uh, I don't think we've ever used it, but it's there, right? 
Um, and of course, you can control the dimness of the bulbs and so forth. And these other lights, these actually control other lights in the bedroom itself. So you, you know, you turn on the light to read or whatever you would use that. Yes. So could you, you, could you set it up to send a signal to the computer to automatically shut it down? Yeah, absolutely you could. Yes, and in fact, I'm going to talk about the computer interface in just a minute. Okay, so um, this is another example. This is the remote right here sitting on the, the, the table. Again, if you wanted to control it. Uh, this is actually the pool pump. This is the switch right here, and this is the, the pump, I think, right there. Um, right, yeah, right, that piece right there. Um, so that actually, again, control turns it on and off. Um, there is actually a, a, an open source program called HeyU, which will basically can turn things on and off. Um, it works really well. It'll basically control X10 signals. Um, you can send on, dim, whatever, and you can script these things real easily. Here's an example of a cron job. Uh, I'm basically saying, okay, at 9 o'clock, turn off the bookcase light. Okay? And then at 10 o'clock, turn off the front lights. And 11 o'clock, turn off the Tiffany light in the family room. You can see it kind of going down, okay? Um, there's actually a pool pump, although I don't see it listed here. Here's one that'll turn on the bathroom light, which is not really a bathroom, but it's like the hallway light. This will turn on the Christmas lights, but I think, I think we need the decor because there's a bunch of little lights that come on around 10 a.m. Um, and then you can do sort of group stuff. So this is actually the thing that shuts off everything at night. It shuts off everything in the first group, but it, but it doesn't shut off the entry table, entryway, because the entryway light at the bottom it is right in front of the stairs. And you know people are going to need that to get upstairs. So I'm like, all right, here's the light. Follow the light. OK, let's go, go up the stairs, go to bed. Um, so uh, again, there's, and then there's, um, this is, there's even some dimming you can do. Uh, to do some to some kind of stuff that, that makes sense. Uh, I talked about computer control. This is actually a, a pretty lousy picture of uh, the device that actually controls uh, the computer. So effectively, uh, this device plugs into the power, and it has a serial cable that goes out into the server. Okay, so hey, you basically can listen to see what X10 activity is happening in the house. So if somebody hits a wireless remote, I will see that si signal coming across, and, and the computer will see it. And I actually have a cron job. It actually looks like this. So it'll say, OK, on this date, uh, although there's no year, I don't know why, you know, these activities happen. So this is actually, I think, the something happened with the dusk sensor. And then my daughter, I guess, turned off the light. and. Um, this is, I think, us going to bed at 11.18 that day. We were actually pressing the, that F, F4 button to shut everything off. And again, I have a cron thing which will go through and basically listens. So it runs, hey you, which I call X10, and it just runs it in monitor mode. And then this is just a shell script that goes through and says, OK, I saw somebody hit, thank you. I saw somebody hit, uh, are you sure on that number time there? Do I have the wrong time? The book says 11.15, that's why I'm. Oh, there is. Oh, OK, great. I did not know that. Good you said something. So um, effectively, we're, gonna, we're basically running through the cron script. And when we see some activity that matches something, we're going to trigger, you know, for example, here they, it's dusk time. So we're going to actually turn on, we're going to turn on all these lights. And then 45 minutes later, I'm going to turn on some other lights. So this actually related to a problem where the dust sensor would go on, and then, uh, my and then the front lights would go on at the same time. And my wife would say, well, you know, it doesn't look right that the lights are going on that early. I'm like, well, it's dusk. Like, what do you want me to do? And it's like, well, we need the lights on inside, but we don't need them on outside yet. It just looks silly. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll just wait and I'll schedule something to happen 45 minutes after the dusk sensor happens, okay? And that's exactly what, what that's doing. And it gives you an idea. Here's the kitchen chime, and you're actually saying time to eat. And here we're actually sending the bell across the whole system. So she has a little remote she presses, and then it basically says time to eat. And it even says it on the laptops, okay? Um, 
So this is where the computer is. And again, the computer can do all these things. Again, this presentation is on the website uh, if you're curious. But it can send signal to turn on the lights. Um, it actually gets uh, sun try sunset information. It can receive information from wireless receivers. Um, it can it can basically do all this kind of stuff here, um, you know, at dusk to do to do a whole bunch of things when it determines the house is getting dark. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, which I have three minutes, um, <clears throat> is the telephone interface. The uh, telephone interface uh, basically is incredibly crude, but it works really well. If that looks like a modem to you, it is. Um, I don't use it as a modem, although I did in my UCP days. Um, effectively, what I'm doing here is I am, uh, many of you might not know that uh, modems actually will do caller ID. So you can basically plug your telephone into this uh, jack here, OK? And it will get uh, caller ID signals, just like a caller ID would show up on a phone. It's showing up on the modem. Well, if you listen, if you connect to the modem and just listen all the time, I know it sounds crazy, but you basically just you open the modem and you just listen for stuff to come in. Um, effectively, you get things that look like this. This is the raw data that's coming through the modem. Okay, um, so it's saying on this date I got a call uh, from this number. This is actually my cell phone. Uh, in Pennsylvania, okay? So I have a script that will, just as I have a script that's listening to all the X10 activity, I have another script that's listening to all the caller ID activity. And when I get some caller ID, I basically take the telephone number, I go to my Rolodex, or my, my, my address book, my telephone address book, and I look to see, does that number match anything in my address book? And if it does, I can print some really nice text here that says, hey, you know, at that time, Bruce and Christine are calling from the cell phone, and that happens to be the number. And I can optionally sound a chime for certain people if they're part of the family. OK? So just as, I, again, just as I have X10, and I look for activity, and I can do trigger things, in the same way, I can uh, basically listen for caller ID activity, do things. I, I log every call that comes into the house. OK? I can dial the phone, too. I can, actually, um, I can actually hook up my address book. So I don't have to go. If I just want to call somebody, I just go like, dial, you know, I just go to the Rolodex and I hit C for cell phone or W for work or H for home. And it says, you line one or line two? Line one, boom, dials the phone. I just pick up the phone. I don't type it out because, frankly, I get it wrong half the time anyway. And it's just not a good use of my time. OK? So not only can you use the caller ID, OK. Uh, not only can you use the caller ID, I've just gained another five minutes. Um, not only can you use the caller ID to get, to get information coming in, but you can also use it to dial out. OK? So family suggestions. And again, uh, I think this gives me a little time to have a very tiny demo uh, in, in the session. And I'm going to do my best to see what I can do with that. OK. So um, basically, Family suggestions. Adding home animation changes your family's home environment. Be careful. Start small. Um, I will tell you one of the tricks that I learned, actually from this book here, uh, which happens to be an O'Reilly book about home automation, is start slow and make incremental changes. Okay? Do something in home automation, and then let it sit for a month. And wait to see how your family reacts, and wait to see if your family comes back to you and says, you know, it would be real. You know, it's really, I'm getting used to this thing. And it would be really neat if you could do this other thing. OK, and then you know, then you know you've won. But don't do that thing right away. OK, wait like two weeks. OK, then do that thing that they want. And then if that's successful, then you can, you can kind of start to move along. And you get less criticism of what you're doing, because now your family's kind of invested in it. It's sort of a psychological thing, but you know, nobody likes their environment to be changed. Nobody wants to change from Windows to Linux or Linux to Ubuntu or, God forbid, they change GNOME 2 to 3, right? I mean, it just, uh, yeah, it's an inside joke, but it, it drives people crazy. It's driving me crazy, frankly. Um, so, so people don't like change forced upon them. They want to be really in control of that. And your family's home is like your family's home. So that's really the last environment they want you to be tinkering with. So 
you often want to start very slow, go small, don't try and take on everything at once, but as you see it working with your family, then you can kind of continue to do more stuff. Uh, except that some home animation tests are not possible. I don't, I don't think motion sensor, I've never done anything with motion sensor. I just don't think it works reliably enough for what I'm doing. I'd rather find something that I can really measure. And again, because of the way the system is all automated and controlled and I can get on the internet and I can do all these crazy things from a server, there's a lot of things I can do very reliably. I don't need that. I, I just haven't found I need, I need motion sensing very much. Um, and because a lot of times you have the problem where like you walk in the room and then it takes five seconds for the light to go on or something. It's just really awkward. And I think it, it just kind of defeats your purpose. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying be prepared for that some things are not going to be doable or acceptable. Um, and again, at the end, you have succeeded when your family asks for home automation additions. Okay? So uh, that's a book that I use to kind of get some ideas. Um, you know, don't end up like Hal, which ends up killing his residents. Okay? Um, I do have another talk, which I'm not going to be able to cover again. Uh, it's basically just, uh, it's another way of looking at home automation. Um, I'll just kind of fly through it really fast. Very similar uh, to what you saw before, but it's basically more oriented toward sort of a, a data flow approach to, to home automation. Looking at sort of how to run, write some of these scripts. Um, basically having somebody press some caller ID comes in and all these things happen. Uh, again, a little more kind of software oriented dialing the, the you know, dialing from a, a, a directory and so forth. Uh, doing things like outside temperature activity, um, you know, activity from your family. Somebody presses a button, you know, it does all these kind of things. Um, so again, it just if you ever find that useful, uh, feel free to use that. So uh, for the huge, uh, tiny amount of time I have remaining. Um, <coughs> what I'm going to try and do is I don't, I don't think I have sufficient internet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call my house. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to see if this will work. So I got the speaker on. Hey, are you there? I'm here. Okay, can you guys hear this? Okay, so unfortunately I don't seem to have any internet, Matthew. Oh. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that was the house talking. That would be pretty cool. Um, so I'm not sure what we can actually demo here. I guess maybe I could call and we could hear it go ding, ding. Does that work? Uh, oh, yeah. Why don't you call the house, babe? Here we go. My wife's going to call. The nearest one? Hold on. Is the phone ringing? No. Oh, oh it's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, what I was really hoping to do was to use uh, Gmail and get the video working and then basically allow you to see the lights going on and off. Unfortunately, my phone is not fast enough to do that here, and the internet locally is not fast enough to do video. So anyway, we tried. So thanks very much. Appreciate it. I will be up here for questions. I have run out of time. Thank you. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. 
The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. 
lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.